Hi, software engineers. Hope you're having a wonderful day today. Coming to you now from the amphitheater here on grounds. Kind of. So, we're still talking about requirements engineering, the systematic way that we go about working with our stakeholders to figure out what it is, what piece of software, what solution they need. Let's remember what a stakeholder is first. Remember, a stakeholder is anyone that has a vested interest in the system. This could be users. This could be the people paying for it. This could be government regulatory bodies. It could be anyone that has to have a say into what the software looks like. So what we want to talk about today is requirements elicitation. So if you remember from the last video, requirements engineering is broken into effectively two phases. There's the elicitation phase, right? Where we are getting the requirements out of the customer, out of the stakeholder. And then there's the modeling phase or the specification phase where we then take those plain language requirements and turn them into something actionable for developers to work on, okay? So today, this video, it's all about requirements elicitation. So what are some things that we can do? I mean, let's just get right down to it. If we're trying to get information out of our customers, what do we do? I mean, you know, naively, you ask them, which is fine. And as a matter of fact, that is one of the elicitation techniques we're going to talk about. But there's, there's a little bit more you can do than that, right? Because it could be that you're building a piece of software that the, has competitors. Maybe you want to take a look at those. Maybe you're building software where there's been a previous solution. Maybe you're building software where there are rules about what you should have in it or not. There are a bunch of different things you could do. So you can do more than just talk to your user. But let's start with that. The interview. You know. Typically, you would want an interview to be a structured um, activity. So you come up with a set of questions, a set, you know, like five, six questions, whatever it might be, and you sit down with a single stakeholder, and then you ask those questions in the same order, same way, like with multiple potential stakeholders. You could have different questions for different categories of stakeholders, but in general, the idea is to get the conversation going. So uh, an interview is meant to be kind of Fewer number of stakeholders, fewer number of people, but a deeper conversation. So you get in there and you start talking to them and you ask follow-up questions. And, you know, it's kind of the natural way that you might start. But it helps to always start with a script. Start with a specific set of questions that you want to ask and then ask follow-ups as you need. Making sure you write down what those follow-up questions are because you want to document the entire process. Observation. This is probably one of my favorites. So watching people do their current daily jobs and see where problems arise. If people are asking you to build a new software solution, there's a reasonable chance they're trying to replace something that they already are using. So you could imagine at some point, before we got Sys, um, you know, folks came in and like, let me sh show me how you go about uh, doing a uh, 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 releasing a hold or, or or doing something with with finances, and then they show them and they're like, oh, we can do better than that. We can argue about sis or not, but he, here's, here's, here's an even better example. So my friends at Willow Tree, awesome folks, go see them, build great stuff. Willow Tree, they got a fantastic contract several years ago with Pepsi, okay? So what, 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 what the software was, uh, is a, a technician. So someone that goes out from Pepsi to repair vending machines and uh, fountain drink machines, things like that, goes out and at the time had this... This incredibly old, like, Motorola looked like a Palm Pilot duct tape to a, a, a light gun, sort of. I mean, you kind of know what I'm what we're talking about here. You know, if you've seen anyone in, a, like, a stock, like, out at a grocery store stocking things, this is kind of the maneuver that they had. And it was cumbersome. And no one liked using it. And they had to have a binder to look up the part numbers. It was terrible. So what they did was, hey, we want to build a single solution for our drivers, for our technicians, that is on an iPad um, that does, you know, barcode reading. It has uh, all the, the their daily time log stuff in it. It can do part orders. It can do everything. It's one portal. They go out in the field. They have this iPad, and they can do everything in it. So Willow Tree, who makes good stuff, you know, wanted to have a really good user interface, wanted to have something that made sense for what the, the technicians are doing, easy to follow. They, they could, you know, throughout their day, it made sense. But in order to do this, they had to know what an average day for one of these technicians were. 
So for two weeks, they had developers riding on trucks with the Pepsi repair individuals to see where the pain points were, where the sticking points were in their job. And that's amazing. I, I mean, that is fantastic. You get to see exactly, oh, okay, that looked like that was terrible. I think I can find a way to make that better for you. A as a developer, it could give you such a, you know, warm fuzzies because you, you, you can spot those, those spots where it's like, oh, wait, there's a technical solution that we could do here that would make it so much better. So observation is really important. So if people are doing a job already, watch what they do. What do they do on a day in and day out basis? What information do they need regularly? What, um, what other people do they have to interact with regularly? That can give you a lot of information that an interview wouldn't because they won't, aren't necessarily thinking about all of the individual things that they do during the day. Along those lines is examining docs and artifacts. So it could be that they have a procedural manual, a <laughs> procedural manual. It could be that they have um, formal documentation that they have to follow, like a set procedure. It could be there are regulations they have to follow. So you should read up on any official documentation or any other hard artifacts that you can get your hands on that would give you an indication as to what's going on. Now, you know, a corollary to this is looking at the competition. You know, you could look at what uh, competing software is doing. A JAD is something that you would probably never do, at least in the context of, of our class. Um, a JAD is a very plan-driven methodology in which it's more around the idea of contract negotiation. Uh, you are in a, you know, in, in the long boardroom table, the whiteboard, the presentation, and there is a much more formal regulated discussion as to what the requirements should be. So, yeah, this is probably the most plan-driven one that, that I could think of. You don't run into it too often. Groupware. Um, imagine that you had a digital whiteboard or maybe a digital like post-it note board or something like that where anyone could toss up an idea. So an ideas board, kind of maybe a message board. You could think of it sort of that way. Uh, maybe you think like a Discord channel or a, or a Slack channel where people can just post ideas. Basically, it's a way of just kind of sifting up a whole bunch of ideas and picking through to see if anything is good. Do these usually come out with solid requirements that you will absolutely do? No, usually not. But there's a lot, probably some good nuggets in here. Um, you're kind of like, you know, panning for gold when you're using this sort of technique. Um, if you want to do a broad ask, but you want more actionable data, then you probably want to do something more like a formal questionnaire or formal survey. So for 3240, I highly expect this to be one that you use uh, in your requirement solicitation. Uh, but the basic idea is you come up with a form, Google Form, SurveyMonkey, whatever floats your boat, and um, a, a few set questions there, some of them Likert, some of them free form, that ask, you know, what parts of a piece of software would someone be interested in? How important are certain features? Um, how much would they be willing to pay? I mean, you can come up with a reasonable set. The key with any good survey, though, particularly, particularly for 3240, is making sure that it's not too long. Survey fatigue is definitely a thing, both with the number of surveys you get asked to take, and also if you start a survey and it says page one of 37, you're just going to say no, and you're going to move on. So keep them short, keep them targeted, uh, specifically on the things you care about. If you, if you ever have the thought, hey, it might be nice if we also ask this, fight that. And don't ask that question because probably you're going to be asking things that no one's going to want to have to answer and then they're going to stop your survey and you're not going to get any data. Prototyping is an amazing way to get really, really good feedback. So this is very common in mobile apps. So what, uh, what many companies do is when the initial contact with a, with a set of stakeholders happens with biz dev, uh, business development for you know developing the contract, uh, they'll get back an initial set of, oh, we kind of wanted to do this, look like this, yada, yada, yada. And the UX team, the user experience team, will go off and do some mock-ups in Photoshop. And there are other tools that allow you to make it so that the, the images have touch targets. So you tap on a touch on, on a spot on the image and it goes to another screen and it looks real for a set of fake data. It's not really doing anything. There's some really, really good prototyping um, tools out there that let you do this without doing a ton of extra work. 
So you basically design a dummy app that you then come back to the customer and say, here, is this what you're thinking? And you instantly get good feedback because they say, I like this. I don't like this. This is where I'm thinking. Yes, more of this. Can we move it like this? As soon as you put something in their hands, um, things just start crystallizing. Even if your prototype is completely wrong, if you show it to them and like, oh, this is, I don't really know about this, but I kind of like this. That's still really, really, really good information. Another story from our friends at Willow Tree, a while back, they were approached by Johnson Johnson and said, you know, we want an app. And, and, and Willow Tree's like, sure, let's do it. What do you want it to do? And Johnson Johnson went, oh, <laughs> we want something kind of in this space. Willow Tree's like, okay. And so that's when they started coming up with the mock-ups to then help go through the process. And, and both the stakeholders and the developers came out very happy at the end because they were able to work together, um, narrowing down the field. So super, super important technique is the prototype. If you have the time, if you have the bandwidth, if you have the personnel, ban uh, prototyping, really, really great thing to do. Focus groups. Uh, imagine that you're building Microsoft Word. You are not gonna ask every user of Microsoft Word, even in a survey, how they like something. But you might get together a group of editors, for instance or administrative assistants, or professors, or students. You could get together small groups of a particular subset of stakeholders and ask them targeted questions in an interview setting. It's what you have to do when you have a large piece of software, the large user base, and you want to do more interview sort of techniques. It's just hard to do, you know, like, oh, we're gonna pick Ahmed and just ask him about Microsoft Word. Yeah, it doesn't work. So there you go. On-site customer, the ultimate in agile, which would be if you are working with a, with a group, uh, with, a, with, a, with a company, and they can actually just embed someone in the team, perfect. If you ever have a question, go ask that person. And they have the, <coughs> typically have the authority to say yes or no, this is what we want, what we don't want. And if they don't know, they can always go back to their, uh, to their company and say, hey, you know, and they can communicate that better than you can because they know the domain better than you. So on-site customer, if you're in an agile group, is really, really helpful because you can have this really, really nice, tight feedback loop. So what are some problems that can happen when you're doing requirement solicitation? Number one, the boundary of the system is ill-defined. Basically, do you know when to stop building? Software engineers have this problem where we always think of the next cool feature and have a really hard time of saying, oh, this is where we need to stop and ship. So making an agreement with the stakeholders up front, this is how far we're gonna go, is very important. Unnecessary design information may be given. It could be that the customer says, and I really want this built with JSON or with React or with whatever, and that's not their job. I mean, that sounds mean, and, and there, there can be a constraint, remember functional, non-functional constraints. There could be reasons a constraint are, is put on a system, but in general, you want the the solution to drive the technology, not the technology to drive the solution. Um, you you wanna come up with what the best answer is and then try to figure out the best way to build it. So try not to let implementation bias uh, sneak into the requirements process. Stakeholders have an incomplete understanding of their needs. This is, this is very, very true. If you remember my example from a few videos ago about the, the CIO, uh, the, like the student group who said we wanted a, a, a piece of software to let people sign up for their events and they didn't really understand what they really needed. They just needed a calendar in this instance. So part of your job as a requirements engineer doing through requirements solicitation is to help the stakeholders formulate what their actual need set is. Um, you're kind of like a counselor in this instance trying to help walk through it, um, but it, it's pretty important so you don't build the wrong piece of software. Stakeholders have a poor understanding of computer capabilities limitations. Ho bunga, is this, is this usually a problem? This is one where, oh my gosh. Um, they say, well, um, I, I want you to build this piece of software and it needs to be able to track a GPS location and report it to a server where we can put a pin in a map. And you're like, no problem, I can do that. And that's super easy. GPS lookup, no problems. And then they say, and I want you to be able to tell me what the person had for breakfast that morning. And to, to some people, like to programmers, you might say, 
Those are completely different problems. And that's hard. I mean, you could have them report what they had for breakfast. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, let's ignore. I, I'm coming up with the fake, ridiculous problem. But to someone who's not familiar with computing or computer science or what the technology can do, the notion of pinpointing someone on the globe instantly versus figuring out, you know, some aspect of their day, those might be equivalent problems in their mind. So you need to be gentle and kind as you talk through what computers can actually do and what the technology actually allows you to pull off. The corollary to this is you as a software engineer don't know what their domain is. You can make assumptions like, oh, well, I can just move this data from here to here because that would just be easier. And, you know, the company you're working with, maybe it's a medical organization says, no, that is highly sensitive medical data. You can't just do that. That's illegal. And, you know, you need to learn up on that because you're the software engineer. But, you know, you need to be open to, to, to hearing that. Um, you can't know all of the stuff immediately in a given domain. This is one of the reasons we like our students to take lots of um, humanities courses and social science courses to try and get experience in more domains than just computing because it's really important for understanding what the software might need to do. The stakeholder and the software engineers speak different languages. This could be literal, where you are speaking English, Spanish, Russian, um, and your customer is speaking Portuguese, German, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, whatever it might be. Um, but I, we're really thinking more here. Uh, you use, the software engineers are using overly technical terminology and the uh, stakeholders are using technical terminology from their field. And you get in this weird standoff where it's like, well, you know, if we use the, the Hyben Fram with the JSON uh, upload to the REST API framework, you're, like, you're trying to sound smart. And you're actually just being a jerk. I mean, really? The, the goal here is for you to work together, not to peacock strut around and try and show off technical superiority. The goal is to help people solve a problem. You know, don't, don't try to talk down to people. Conversely, stakeholders don't do the same. You know, we don't necessarily know what a balance sheet is in the context of, of banking software or financial software or something like that. So let's agree to be kind and to work together to figure out what actually needs to, to happen. Obvious information is omitted. Super easy for software engineers to just say something and forget, oh, this person doesn't have four years of programming experience. This is a little different than the speaking different languages because this, this usually lines up more with just, oh, oops, I'm sorry. Um, so. Again, try to make sure that you spell things out. Like, what does it mean to have a server? People don't necessarily know that. What does it mean for something to be in the cloud? People don't necessarily know that either. What is the difference between an iOS app and an Android app? That's not, that's not bad if people don't know that. People are experts at different things. So be kind. Uh, stake, stakeholders have conflicting views. Yeah, this happens. Um, particularly if you have a piece of software with lots of stakeholders, lots of different categories of stakeholders. Take SIS, the Board of Visitors, um, CHEV, which is the State Council for Higher Education in Virginia, uh, the Provost Office, the Finance Office, faculty, student. I mean, I could keep going and going and going. Which stakeholders win? I mean, often whoever's paying for it, but that might not necessarily be the case. It's good to, to clear up up front if there is a conflict in opinions of what a requirement should be from the stakeholders, who wins? Um, because you can't satisfy everyone all the time, uh, necessarily. Requirements are vague and untestable, such as user-friendly and robust. Um, we'll talk about this when we're, when we're doing more requirements definition and user stories and things like that, but requirements need to be specific, repeatable, understandable, measurable. They need to be something that if I read it and you read it, we would agree that we have the same idea as to what this is. So bear that in mind. Requirements are volatile and change over time. It's software. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Requirements are gonna change. Um, even in plan driven environment, it's possible. So you just gotta be cognizant of that and make sure you're recording your requirements in such a way that you can handle change. But which techniques do you use? I mean, there is no one answer. 
it's going to depend on the project, on the set of stakeholders, on the size of the project, the amount of money that you have, the time that you have. One thing you have to be careful about, though, is how much information you want to actually gather. So if you don't gather enough information, you're likely to build the wrong product because you don't necessarily have a good handle on exactly what it is that you're building. You could be missing key features. You may have to start all the way over, which would be super bad, but also you can't estimate. Without a good understanding of what the software needs to be, you can't say, we can have it done in six months. We can have it done in a year. We can have it done for a budget of X or something like that because you have an incomplete picture. So you need to do a reasonable amount of software, of software requirement and licitation. But you can also fall into the trap of gathering too much. So if you collect way too many requirements, maybe you do surveys and interviews and focus groups and a prototype, you start inviting conflicting requirements. You're going to start getting instances where you're going to have a survey um, contingency that says we must have this, but then you have a prototype and show it to a core stakeholder and the core stakeholder says, no, I really want it th like this. I'm going, to, I'm going to have to deal with the survey people another time. It's going to be tough. Um, and you might be introducing conflict like in the organization. So you don't want to go overboard because also then it takes more time and takes more resources. So this could affect your ability to hit the market at, at a reasonable time and also to deliver on time. So identify which stakeholders are most important. Who really is going to be using the software the most? Who holds the purse strings? Who has the final say on what you're doing? And then work with them to set up, well, who are the other groups I need to talk to? And what, what are the aspects they need to do? and try to build out as best you can a plan for the set of stakeholders, the set of techniques to gather a reasonable amount of information. For 3240, we probably expect you to do some interviews one-on-one -on -one just with some friends. Uh, we expect you probably to do some surveys, uh, generally just groups that you're in, asking them what they think about certain ideas for your software. Could you do other things? Sure. Um, some of them are kind of hard to do uh, in the environment, but I'm sure you can figure something out. So that's the basics of doing requirement solicitation, some techniques, uh, when you might want to use them, how you might want to use them, and I hope that helps. So if you're working with folks trying to figure out what piece of software to build or what that piece of software should look like, number one rule, be kind to each other. You're working together to come up with a solution. You're trying to solve problems. Don't create new ones by grandstanding. Don't create new ones by, by not putting forth the effort to understand where each group is coming from. Because, yeah, it's tough sometimes for technical people and non-technical people to talk about potential software solutions because you might be speaking different languages. But it's a skill that will serve you really, really well in the future if you work at it and you practice, and um, you'll find that you'll just build better software. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.